Hello and welcome to North Country Matters. This civic media education program is produced by WCKN, student-run cable television of Clarkson University. The program is a partnership production of Clarkson Center for Excellence in Communication, St. Lawrence County Chapter of the American Association of University Women, and the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters. My name is Ellen Heenan. I'm a student in a communication and media course at Clarkson University. I and a number of my classmates provide the production crew for this series. This program is another, is another in a series that we call Finding Common Ground. Today, folks will be talking about the current state and outlook for the future of K-12 public education in the North Country. Our moderator for the discussion is Alexandra Jacobs. Thanks, Ellen. If you live in the North Country, you know that national, state, and local budgets are in crisis. These public financing problems are having a harsh impact on our K-12 public schools as well. With cuts in aid, unfunded mandates, and the burden of soaring health care costs, these pressures and more have led to political gridlock during the annual budget process. Meanwhile, some districts have seen civil discourse degenerate to ineffective name-calling and mudslinging. The intense concentration on these issues often obscures not only finding an answer, but also the underlying questions. How do we have productive discussions about these difficult and pressing issues instead of falling into the abyss of an entrenched ideology? Can we have a conversation that yields a result that is better than those proposed by any single interest group? Today we'll talk about the pressing question facing our schools. Are we doing what's best for the students? Joining us on the panel today are Tom Burns, District Superintendent for St. Lawrence Lewis Boses. Donna Seymour of the American Association of University Women and also a parent and grandparent. Elizabeth Kearney, superintendent of the Norwood Norfolk Central School District. And Ann Carvel, a teacher and former school board president at Potsdam Central School District. And Tom, I was wondering if you could start by framing the number one challenge that you see facing K-12 education in the North Country today. Well, I, I know we're going to get into the specifics, but I, I think maintaining quality educational programs for our North Country students uh, that will enable them to be successful both in college and in specific careers uh, is going to be our biggest challenge. And I was wondering if we could go around so best, why don't you continue? Well, I think that the implication in what Tom said is that our the quality of our education depends on funding equity. And right now we're starting the school year, the budget season, and we're discovering that this year, even more than in the past, we're struggling. We're doing things, being forced to do things that are not in the best interest of children because of the fact that we are in rural poverty. Mm -hmm. and uh, my concern mirrors uh, Tom's. Uh, I'm concerned about the quality of education for students because it will inevitably be impacted by massive teacher layoffs, record teacher layoffs, which are caused by Liz's discussion on funding problems and inequities. Mm -hmm. So it will come down to problems in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And Donna? I've got concerns that the testing mandate that was accelerated under No Child Left Behind has become more about defining success for teachers in schools than it is a tool to show mastery uh, and progress for our students. So I think that refocusing our efforts on student achievement is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for starting the conversation. I'd like to cover all of those issues in depth later as we continue. But let me start with some recent developments. Um, in his State of the State address, Governor Andrew Cuomo recently declared himself the student's lobbyist, saying that his focus in 2012 will be on three areas, teacher accountability, student achievement, and management efficiency. We're going to discuss the details of each of those areas in a second, but before we start, I want to ask about the figures that the governor used to support his initiatives. Um, he said that New York State is number one in spending and number 38 in results, meaning graduation rates, within the United States. Uh, now, that's an average for the whole state, and I'm curious what those numbers actually look like in the North Country. So I was wondering, Tom, could you start by giving me an idea of how, where do we stand within the state? Certainly. Um, I, I would like to just point out that 
We're not exactly sure where the governor is getting his uh, number that we're 38 in graduation rates. Um, so it's it's hard to push back against that without knowing exactly, uh, you know, he's not citing his sources. Mm -hmm. um, we think it's decade old data uh, that is looking at, you know, the number of people in the state that have high school diplomas that may have moved in from other states, that there are a lot of variables there. So I, I would question that number 38, first of all. Um, the state average, uh, Alex, the last few years has hovered around 72, 73 mm percent. -hmm. Uh, statewide. For last year, the 18 component districts in our region uh, had a 77.4 percent graduation rate. Um, we had two school districts with 62 uh, percent. I'm sure that's not where they wanted to be. Uh, when you only have 18 school districts, that pulls the average down. Um, there actually was a, a very uh, normal distribution of graduation rates. There was a bell curve with the mm -hmm. graduation rates among the uh, districts in the county. We had a couple of school districts in the 90th percentile with graduation rates. Uh, so we think overall we're doing uh, well. We're exceeding the state average. Um, we have some student subgroup areas that you know we'd like to improve. Um, there's always room for improvement. I, I would agree with the governor on that. Um, but I think what you don't see is you don't see uh, school-wide failures the way you're seeing in urban areas and other parts of the state mm -hmm. where schools are failing on every indicator. E even the schools that would like to improve in this region um, tend to be down in one subgroup area, maybe students with disabilities or students from high poverty mm -hmm. areas, as, as Bess has mentioned. Um, when you look at the expenses, our mm -hmm. districts are spending anywhere between 16000 and $30,000 uh, per pupil. Uh, there are districts in this state that spend eighty and ninety thousand dollars in suburban areas per pupil. So again, I, we're above state averages. Um, can can we get better? Yes, um, we're spending well below uh, mm -hmm. what many districts spend around the state. So that's great. Well, I, I'd like to dive right in and, and get in, in depth on some of those issues. So. Teacher accountability and reviews of educators has been a hot topic across the country um, for a while now. And certainly there's been increased scrutiny of teachers, individual teachers, along with each budget season as, as there's the tough choices about which positions are kept and, and which ones can't be. Um, the federal race to the top program has also brought this issue to the forefront, at least in New York State. Um, and Bess, your district, Norwood Norfolk Central School, is the only one in New York State to settle on an annual professional performance review for teachers. And this is something that Andrew Cuomo is, is again, calling for all districts to implement. Um, I'm curious, how, how, did, how does it work, and, and how did you become the first? Well, uh, and I would have to fact check that with, with uh, Tom. I believe that there are a handful of districts now that have settled with their teachers. And how we became among the first, Alexandra, I don't know. I, I think it was maybe, hopefully not unique to my district, but we have a very good relationship with our teachers and their bargaining unit. Our focus was on the children, mm -hmm. on the students and their achievement. Uh, uh, we had the opportunity last year to, uh, to go out to Denver to that, that large mm -hmm. meeting with the, uh, our National Department of Education it was sort of a wake-up call that unless administration and teachers cooperate that we can't do as much for for students uh, on the other hand when we do we can do a lot so uh, I have to salute my teachers and they are, are embracing the process so I anticipate how does, it, how does it work for them what is it what is it measuring how does it work in your district well it's measuring not just state test scores. It's also measuring local assessments mm -hmm. and it's measuring teacher performance based on a specific rubric. My assessment, and I am speaking for them, is that it puts clarity in the process. Mm -hmm. The expectations of, of professional behavior and instruction become crystal clear. They know exactly what the expectations are, how, the, how they will be measured, and we're moving ahead together learning what those parameters are. 
Now, Anne, you're a former teacher, um, and and of course have been on the other side on the board of education. I'm curious what your thoughts about about all this are, and, and if it can capture um, the things that make a teacher great or or, or maybe poor. Well, um, first of all, I want to applaud Norwood Norfolk and the fact that they and Mrs. Kearney and her teachers for what they've been able to do. They've led the way, and and with regards to APPR, the performance review. I think it's a very complicated process, and I think historically um, management and labor can look at each other with adversarial eyes and be somewhat suspicious. Certainly from my work on, on the Board of Education, I have found that even one word that is misplaced in a document can have a huge unintended impact. So I think part of the reason why we don't have all of these agreements settled already is because it is complicated and they don't want unintended results. And, and as I say, possibly distrust, which obviously Mrs. Kearney manage, has managed to get trust in her district. Um, with, with regards to uh, teachers, um, if I were back in the trenches as a teacher, I would be glad for this level of accountability. I think, I think it's healthy. And I think that the administrators are left with a lot of freedom to examine teaching, not just uh, in many ways, and, and the creative aspect of it, that it's an art, not just a science that can be checked off. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll, it'll work fine mm -hmm. when it's implemented. Well, moving on to, to the second point that the governor is really pushing for this year, and that's student achievement. Um, this is often measured in numbers, so test results, graduation rates, as we were speaking about before, college acceptances, and, and other numbers. So let's talk about a little bit more about how we're doing in the North Country. And Donna, I, I know that you have concerns about an overemphasis on testing. We just talked a little bit about how it plays into the APPR, but um, you know, in terms of measuring district performance and classroom performance and student performance, I'm curious what, what you think about testing. Well, uh, I do have concerns about it, Alex, and as a former student myself, <laughs> and a parent and now a grandparent with um, at least one grandchild in the school system, I've really seen what appears to be a real over overemphasis about testing that has gone down uh, to younger and younger grades, and it seems to have more and more impact. So that, that focus is really um, a concern because I'm not sure it's always um, student-driven. Um, the problem about testing that we've seen in the last couple of years that's really come to the forefront as we've looked at this nationally is the problem with cheating. We've got districts that, uh, states that give bonuses based on test results of students and that creates an opportunity for people to have a financial incentive to make the grades look better than they are. Um, we saw this spring down on Long Island there was the situation with students who were cheating. They were getting somebody to come in and take tests for them. I saw just this morning in the newspaper that now at least one state legislature wants to create uh, a, a new law that says that if you cheat on an SAT, it's a criminal behavior. So I think we've kind of gotten to the point where, we're, where this situation is out of control. When we are turning students into criminals because we've put the emphasis on testing, somewhere we're out of balance. So the other thing about testing that really concerns me and is the fact that in the last few years the testing industry has really grown exponentially and it's extremely expensive. Millions and millions of dollars are pulled out of education to pay for testing. That money is not available to classrooms, it's not available to teachers, and it's not available to students. When you have tight budget years, like we have this year and we've had the last couple of years, those missing dollars are really felt a lot. So I think the challenge is how do we use assessment tests which tests are valuable in measuring students? What gives us real information about how they're doing and a test that actually raises the bar for everyone instead of lowering it because we've got to come up with a national standard? So uh, as somebody pointed out in one of our meetings, there is no job for test taking. So, <laughs> so it's not a real world job. So we need to use testing as, uh, as a means to an end, but not an end in itself. And I think if we can find a way to do that, then if it relates directly to student achievement, 
we're starting to get to the place we need to be. Mm -hmm. Donna, I think you made some very valid points there. I have to agree. The original intent of the state assessments was as a, a predictor. Yeah. It was a, a formative assessment that was supposed to supply schools, and still does, supply schools mm -hmm. with information that will help us decide which of the students who need extra help, intervention services, and the ones who are on the higher end we know are on track for graduation. What's happened now is rather than helping schools to remediate and enrich, it has become a bludgeon. Uh, schools are being judged by their state assessment scores rather than having them, as you well pointed out, as a tool to help students. Mm -hmm. So there is a place for them, but I think they're misplaced right now. Now some of those other numbers we had mentioned before also, not just to stick to testing, I was curious in your district, uh, what are you doing to you know, uh, reduce dropout rates, to improve graduation rates? I mean, I know you must pay attention to all of these numbers as a superintendent. So, so what are you looking at? We are looking hard at the dropout rate, Alexander, because it's totally unacceptable. Uh, I, I asked my board, what, where should we be shooting for? The, uh, I believe the Board of Regents, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, is it, is it the 80% now that they're looking for is 80% graduation rate? Correct. Okay. So I said, well, what's acceptable for a dropout rate? And my board, bless them, said zero. That I have to agree with them. There must be no educational collateral damage. <laughs> now, do we have a system that really supports that? We do tend right now to have a one-size-fits-all. It's the state assessments, it's the regents' exams, it's really uh, not valuing as much as we should. Mm -hmm. Students who learn differently, perform differently, and demonstrate their learning differently. Uh, one of the things we're doing is actually identifying some of the factors that are leading to dropouts, things like attendance and discipline issues and so on. and. Uh, I don't want to say targeting, but identifying students at, at, as early in age as possible and then booking them up with supports, mm -hmm. with actually an increasing tier of supports so that we can keep them in school, keep them engaged, and keep them connected mm -hmm. to adults. Great. You know, one of the uh, phrases that we've all heard is, um, um, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. But to get to this point about how expensive it is to have to the cost to society for a dropout, there's a new study that was just released by the White House Council for Community Solutions, and it looked at the question, what does one jobless youth cost taxpayers? And the report profiles the economic lives of the roughly 6.7 million Americans between the ages of 16 and 24 who are neither working nor in school. The young and the jobless earn less later in life. They lose the chance to build oh, no, crucial nice. career skills. They rely on government support, and they're more likely to commit crime. And according to the report, mm -hmm. they're costing us about $14,000 a year in taxes per person, and they're costing the economy $40,000 a year in lost productivity. Yeah. So kudos to Norwood Norfolk and the board who say we can't afford to let one child drop out because they're right. At those kinds of figures, the cost to society to fail a student, because that's really what we're talking about. We failed a student if, they, if we can't find a way to keep make them successful in school. That cost is on us as a society. And you know when you when you talk about how much we're spending per student up here, what sixteen thousand dollars? I think you said minimum. You know, start doing the math when you're talking at, uh, an additional fourteen thousand dollar in taxes and forty thousand dollars in lost productivity, and mm -hmm. pretty soon education becomes uh, something we should really be focusing on. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. Um, you put it basically education as an investment, right. Um, and right now the funds to make that investment are getting kind of thin. Um, so. The other piece that the governor spoke about was management efficiency. Um, and I have to say that sounds great. Um, you have fewer dollars to go around. What can we do to make sure that most of that, as many as possible, stay in the classroom and stay helping our children? Um, so we've seen a lot of cuts to teaching positions in recent years. 
or at the very least those are the ones that draw quite a bit of attention you know when they are on the chopping block but I'm curious we don't hear as much about cuts to administrative positions or um, consolidations attrition elimination of those positions so I'm curious in the North Country schools uh, maybe Tom you would see from the BOCES level um, have there have there been cuts of that type and I'm also curious how BOCES might play a role in um, stepping in for those districts that can't keep that level of administration that they used to be able to afford. Mm -hmm. I, I think the BOCES has taken over uh, a, a good share of one of the major initiatives when Bess was talking about the teacher evaluation program, but really the entire race to the top, the network teams that were required to be established. Um, the districts in this BOCES got such small allocations that they all decided to pool their money mm -hmm. with the BOCES and uh, we were able to go out hire uh, part-time retired administrators who already had expertise that were geographically you know tied to one part of the county um, so you know we have an instant support team now uh, that can fill in the gaps for the districts and I think have done a great job doing that um, in regards to the management efficiency uh, we have heard I think David Wakeland several times now the, the governor's deputy secretary for education um, and he's been with us about six months he came from another state he has a policy background and so I, I think that's a lot of where this conversation is coming from David is is quite a hand to say every time I've seen him uh, New York State lacks a performance management culture um, and you know I think that's fine to say but I think if that had been asked of school districts we gladly would have supplied that information um, I, I think it's not difficult to say that we're probably the most overregulated state in the country uh, in terms of unfunded mandates in terms of reporting that the school districts have to do I mean just for your annual budget every year you have to produce reams of paper and countless hours and you know, if, if the governor's office or the legislators in the past had asked us to provide data about student achievement per dollar spent, um, I think we would be doing that. So that's a conversation I, I'm willing to have. Um, in terms of actual administrative positions, mm -hmm. I think the proof is in the pudding. And I would never have uh, envisioned myself agreeing with E.J. McMahon who heads up uh, the Empire Center, kind of a tax watch group for the state. Uh, but if you go on their website, www.seethroughnewyork.net, um, you will see that our districts are among the most efficiently managed in the state um, when you, look, you break down their administrative costs per pupil. Um, and I, you know, I think actually we shed administrative positions many years ago. Um, when you compare us to wealthy suburban areas, we don't have assistant superintendents in this region. Uh, if you're the superintendent, you're it. You know, I think we have three assistant superintendents in the county. Um, we shed all of our assistant principals. Again, there might be a handful around. So these uh, kind of extra layers of bureaucracy that exist in other parts of the state uh, have, have long since uh, existed here. And I think uh, in a lot of our smaller districts, when you look at the building principal, uh, they may be the transportation supervisor. In many cases, they're the athletic director. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the CSE chair. Um, so, you know, it reaches a point where I, I think you can only stretch that as far as it goes. Um, the other point that shouldn't be lost here is that when the gover governor talks about bureaucracy, he's talking about, and this is, uh, goes back to where I questioned his figure about 38th in, in graduation, he's talking about every position that's non-instructional. So we've looked at his percentages. So he, he's lumping librarians, guidance counselors, et cetera when he says administrative he's looking at every non-teaching position and you know I, I think we can't forget how closely tied administrators and teachers are in their work in in aiding students uh, you know if, if uh, there are serious behavioral issues in a classroom the principal has to address that so that the teacher can do their job and provide the appropriate instruction to the rest of the class mm -hmm. so we need to you know think about how those two roles fit together and not forget that yeah and I also wanted to put that to Anne because of course as you know with experience in the classroom you know you have one view of administrators and then also 
you know, as a Board of Education president, you sometimes uh, can have a um, working hand in hand with your administration, your superintendent, and other times um, you're the people's voice and you might disagree with the way things are going with the district. And so it's an interesting relationship that one sees with school boards and volunteer boards. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious what you think about administration of school districts in North Country. Well, um, I agree with Tom that what I've seen over the last 20 years in, uh, in Potsdam anyway is that administration has been lean um, and the state has put so much on the shoulders of administration that it's becoming an increasingly, increasingly high stress job. There's no question about that. Having said that, does that mean it's as lean as it can be? No. I, 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 think, I think that there are some areas where uh, positions could be combined uh, to save the taxpayer yeah. money. Likewise, with regards to some business endeavors that are done individually by every school, uh, I think it could only be more efficient if in our county, in, in the St. Louis, Bo uh, St. Lawrence, Louis, Boces region, that maybe payroll would be done in one place for everybody. Um, I, I think that there is repetition and uh, people such as the superintendents, board members, et cetera, need to sit down and hammer out possible ways to save the taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. Tom, are you familiar with the way um, education is organized in Florida, which is on a county basis? My daughter uh, and son-in-law teach down there, and they actually work for Pasco County, and uh, although they teach in, in two different elementary schools, but they do have that one layer of mm -hmm. administration and then building principles that take care of the actual day-to-day -day operations. Does that seem to you like a workable model and something that we might be able to look at here in New York State? Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that could work very well. Um, the, the two counties I'm familiar with are uh, Montgomery County in Maryland and Fairfax County in Virginia, where they're high performing. They've definitely uh, gained efficiencies by, by doing that. Um, the problem in New York is, is, you know, we have such a tradition of local control. Um, and that is a, a difficult culture to overcome. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be a problem in the southern states that, that use that system. Um, I, I actually think it could work quite well. Uh, I question whether there are, some people tend to think there are fewer administrators in, in southern schools or countywide systems. Um, I don't know this. I would have to, you know, check the data. I tend to think there are more administrators in those systems. Um, but I think what you see are more specialized administrators. Right. And back to Ann's point, uh, one thing I do agree with is, you know, if we have 18 component districts, we have at least 18 building principals in this county that are running themselves ragged every day doing the same job, doing the same thing in 18 different places. So you could create some more specialized specialized positions that would support kids in a much better way. Uh, mm -hmm. Curriculum directors, for you know, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that model is, is a good one. Um, the other issue that uh, I think we would need to address is what happens with taxation rates. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we have a, v a varied tax rate in this county, anywhere from 11 or $12 per thousand up to 25 So if we were to run a countywide school system, that means we'd have to have a tax rate that settles out uh, a county school tax, somewhere $15, $16 per thousand. And that's going to create a lot of winners and a lot of losers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's because, again, this local uh, control tradition we have in New York State, we have so many taxation entities and so many local layers. Um, that, right. That's what I don't know right. how, how we move beyond. Right, and, and you know, that gets to the big issue obviously looming over all of this, which is funding. Um, and I know we touched on this earlier. Um, and many no Northern New York superintendents have been pleading for relief, you know, from Albany. Um, the Alliance for Quality Education recently found that New North Country schools are the third poorest in the state in terms of financial support for student. And I know, Tom, you mentioned those numbers earlier. So what can we do in this politicized atmosphere where there's only so much money both locally from our you know, property taxpayers but also, also from New York State and, and even coming down from the federal government to protect and increase, even increase funding for our students here in this region? Um, and I was curious if you wanted to start just from the Board of Education perspective. Well, um, it's quite clear to me that matters have gotten so dire that lobbying seems to be the major thing that mm -hmm. boards can do. 
Uh, we have the New York State School Boards Association, our lobbying arm. Um, money is paid to them to, to do their work. But I think in the past we've left it too much to them. I think board members would be uh, helping the districts enormously by calls to politicians, visiting them, sh you know, showing up in Albany, Watertown, wherever they have their offices. And finally, uh, communication is so easy nowadays with computers, I think it would behoove boards of education to get the parents, the voting public, to put their, affix their names to documents and send it to politicians because they pay attention to votes and we really have to light a fire under the public to demand uh, equity in funding in the North Country. Mm -hmm. Now, Bess, what are you seeing? Of course, you know, it's interesting because school districts, your, your budgets are voted on every year. You know when the public is happy or not happy with your budget. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what do you think going into this budget year? We've been doing a lot of talking, Alexander. We've had, we're approaching our third community forum mm -hmm. where we're inviting representatives from every constituency within the district and anyone who shows up with an interest to just talk, to talk about some of the issues. Not necessarily to come to any consensus, uh, not to solve problems for us, but to make the board aware of all of the different needs and, and values that are out there so we can even begin. Um, it's a delicate balance mm -hmm. and we do honor the the limitations of our tax base. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're talking about our future mm -hmm. and giving the students and the families what they need. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough. I have, let me tell you a story though, that it brings so much hope. Uh, we have some very strong teachers in the arts and I'm very, very proud of the work they're doing. So recently, uh, well over a dozen of our students were in a juried art show in Syracuse. Their work for middle school and high school students was sent down to Syracuse and they won many, many awards. Uh, so we loaded up a bus with the principal and the art teachers and took a day trip down so they could receive their awards. And, uh, it was an eye-opener for our teachers and our students because when they walked around the gallery, uh, there were school districts that could even supply nude models for their sketching classes. It, my board's not going in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, it, very tastefully done, al although the, the students did linger. Uh, <laughs> but they, there's, there are schools that can afford a teacher who only teaches ceramics. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of funding in some of these school districts, and yet our students did well. They competed with students who are from much more affluent districts and showed up well. And my principal was so wonderful to point out to the students, you have nothing to apologize for. You have the ability. You can do it. And so I think even beyond our fears of inadequate and inequitable funding, we cannot afford the poverty of expectations that might creep in. And we must educate our students to know that they are as able and as capable and have the same future. And uh, I'll, I'll bet you're going to bring this up later, Donna. But here we are in an environment with multiple institutions of higher education that are here to provide that kind of example mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to our students. So I don't want to dwell on mm -hmm. the lack of funding. Maybe we need to be a little more hopeful. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to just say something really quickly about the point that Bess is making, speaking of the arts and I'll add reading because for my friends and relatives and acquaintances across the state whose jobs are in jeopardy right now, um, what we all know is that music and art are being targeted first, but also right on the heels of that, I'm being told, reading mm -hmm. teachers are going. Mm -hmm. Now, it's fine to say that all elementary teachers are prepared to teach reading, 
but I went through the education system and then I got my master's in reading and I know that what I knew after a bachelor's was nothing compared to after I got the master's and some experience. So I don't think reading teachers are throwaway employees mm -hmm. and, and neither do I do for, for the arts which have correlated with success in math and science and uh, some of these courses are what keep students in school so I think that we have to be very careful uh, where we decide certain things are expendable. Mm -hmm. You know along those lines and I am a big believer in the can-do attitude in the North Country and how we can we can stretch a dollar until it absolutely screams and then still find some change out of it but one of the problems with with rural poverty is that it's really begun to accelerate in the last few years with the downturn of the economy. One of the statistics I read today was that nationally the number of homeless children has risen 38 percent just from 2007 to 2010. Now much of that rise has actually been in suburban areas and suburban areas are the places that we think of as safe spaces for families and it's just not true anymore that that those are safe places we've actually seen uh, downward class migration, which is, appears to be coming into more of a sense of permanency. It's not just a temporary loss of your economic income, it's more of a permanent loss. And there's polls out there that indicate that many Americans don't think that their children are gonna have as good a life as they had. So those are, those are real issues that we have to struggle with. The thing that concerns me is I feel like we might be just on the edges of institutionalizing poverty and low economic status as a way to qualify for state aid. The, this article that was just in the paper this morning about how most uh, North Country districts can't apply for the 25 or the 250 million dollars that the state is making available is because our test scores aren't low enough and our kids aren't poor enough. I mean, where our social economic status isn't bad enough. That is really sending the wrong message. If a budget is a statement about your values, what does it say when the state says, you've got to be worse off than you are in order to qualify for this money? Doesn't that make it somehow attractive to look worse than you are or to focus on that? And you take what you're talking about is we don't have to have poverty of expectation. And I, I agree with that 100%. But if we're making decisions based on other kinds of poverty and we're rewarding it, what are we really setting ourselves up for in the long run towards you know, success or failure? Yeah, and I think that was the most disturbing thing about the governor's budget proposal is the $250 million in competitive grants that he pulled out of the, uh, he's always promised a 4% increase, which translated to 805 mm -hmm. million new dollars. Um, and he delivered the $805 million and then proceeded to take $250 million out for these competitive grants. And it goes back to the point about the lack of a performance management culture that we're hearing some of his aides talk about. And again, we, we welcome that conversation. Uh, the short-term issue is those systems are not in place yet. I mean, Bess has a signed agreement for APPR. Mm -hmm. I think the districts are going to get there. Um, we may be looking at some long-term uh, structural reform, consolidations, et cetera, mm -hmm. but we're not there yet. Yeah. So don't pull the funding until those structures are in place because we, we've got some districts that um, are in serious crisis right now financially and, and I think educationally. So our job, and, and someone mentioned advocacy, I, I think, Ann, you did, and all the advocating we've been doing. And, uh, I, you know, it's paid some dividends, um, but, you know, when, when you're thinking you're going to get a stick in the yeah. eye and, you know, I, I guess we're slightly better off. So, so our expectations maybe were, were a little too low. Um, we did get some additional aid, but it, 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 I have serious concerns about is it enough to get us through the two or three years that we can institute uh, systems of reform, restructuring, et cetera, that will um, allow us to keep providing that program. Well, you know what's a little scary is, to me, it seems like we've turned education funding into some kind of a reality game show. It's race to the top. It's compete here for this money at the state level. That implies that there are going to be winners and losers. Mm -hmm. We can't afford to have winners and losers. We have to educate all students. We can't just have the students lucky enough to be in a winning district or a winning state mm -hmm. get a good education. And this idea that 
that we could have that kind of competition and still not, we're not going to hurt students? Of course we're going to hurt students. We're winning zip code. The, the, exactly. Yes. The, yeah. the interesting thing about the, the competition argument that you're making is the country that ranked first in the PISA results last year, Finland, revamped their educational system, you know, in the last five or ten years, and they did so just to ensure equity, what mm -hmm. you're talking about. They said every child in, in Finland should have a, an appropriate quality education. And just by structuring it that way, they shot up to number mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. they, weren't, they weren't aiming for that. Mm -hmm. They weren't trying to go there. But by trying to address poverty and make sure every child had a quality education, they're number one this year. Well, you know, you, you've been talking a lot about innovative ideas, so let's talk about transformational changes. And Tom, I know that St. Lawrence Lewis Boses recently completed a study along with the Rural Schools Association at Cornell University about the feasibility of regional consolidation, reorganization, and shared services in the area that you serve. So can you tell us a little bit about that study? And, uh, and, and some of the options that it presented for the 18 districts, districts that you represent? Yes, yes. Um, well, the, the first question everybody asked me is, uh, Tom, is there an executive summary? Because it's over 300 pages. <laughs> so I brought the executive summary. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, there are some great recommendations here. Uh, somebody earlier touched on non-instructional sharing, back office consolidations. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I, I think that's a good place to start because it, it doesn't strike the emotional cord that sharing some of the instructional services does. It's a good way to ease into it. Um, and, you know, uh, Donna, when you mentioned the countywide system, some of these recommendations mirror that. They're calling for uh, all of the school districts moving to a comprehensive central business office that would include mm -hmm. all business and human resource functions. Um, and actually, we've seen just in the last year, we've gone from six districts to nine in our cooperative business service. So what I'm seeing with a lot of these recommendations is districts are asking for them anyway, mm -hmm. even before the, the survey came out. Um, they're saying centralize all the food service management in the county. We had no idea we were serving uh, 16,000 school lunches in the county in a day. And because we're spread all over and we have small staffs, et cetera, our average lunch price was a little above the state average. And you translate that, 16,000 kids a day, 180 days a year, we're losing a lot of savings there. Um, they recommended building a regional uh, model for operations and maintenance so that you wouldn't necessarily need all the dedicated staff you have for uh, the maintenance of your facilities, but we would have kind of uh, almost like SWAT teams uh, of <laughs> operations and management, uh, you know, people that could be uh, centered and maybe in three sites around the county that could shoot out to provide uh, certain things like maybe uh, addressing a boiler issue that doesn't happen every day, mm -hmm. but it, it, people would have access to. Um, the consultants recommended looking at a region-wide transportation study. Um, they couldn't even get into that themselves after looking at all the instructional and non-instructional. Um, we are the largest geographic county in the state, mm -hmm. um, over 2,600 square miles, so it's, it's obviously something we need to look at. There were six different technology uh, recommendations. So I think, uh, again, you know, everything from managed IT uh, to leveraging technology in the classroom, more distance learning, um, taking advantage of, of technology. Um, they did recommend that we work with our legislative officials on looking at regional high schools and, uh, you know, trying to get bills produced in terms of how are they governed, how would they function. Um, I have seen a couple of sample bills in the State Senate, and so I, I think these are very good recommendations. It's a good place to start, um, especially with the non-instructional services. Uh, it's a good way to, to have that uh, sharing, you know, kind of behind the scenes mm -hmm. um, so that the kids aren't directly affected. And Donna, and oh, I'm sorry, Bess, I just wanted to say, I know Donna had um, some really interesting ideas about the promise of this regional high school idea, so I just wanted to know if you could share. Well, I actually think this is probably one of the greatest opportunities for our particular reason, region. We've talked about the challenges of rural, rural poverty, and one of the biggest barriers in this county, as Tom just said, is transportation. Um, it's a huge county, but we actually have a hugely successful rural transportation network in our 17 bus districts that mirror our school districts. We know how to get to kids, we know how to move kids. And um, so how do we leverage that asset to create a better set of educational opportunities? I think every elementary age student should be 
educated as close to their home as they could so that they don't spend a lot of time on the bus. When you get to middle school, you can spend a little bit more time on the bus, but by the time you get to high school, that's where we really open up, I think, a lot of opportunity if we look at a regional model. We, we can't duplicate the same high school experience 17 different places because we've got different sized high schools, they have different uh, teacher capacities, and we just we can't do it. But if we get districts to specialize in things that they do very well, one example, of course, is here in Potsdam, we have the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam, which has always given our community and our students a wonderful advantage because of the type of people that are in the community because of Crane. So those resources are very rich, but why should only our students be able to take advantage of that? There should be no geographic barriers in my mind. I think we ought to be able to open that up to, to any student in the county who wants to have take advantage of that. Uh, one of the things I'd like to see is a STEM high school on the grounds of SUNY Canton. In Brockport, where my daughter, the Florida teacher, went to school, the high school at Brockport sits on the SUNY campus, and those kids get to take classes as high school students or as college freshmen. Mm -hmm. They can take either and get credit. What a wonderful opportunity. We have four colleges in this county. So the number of partnerships that we could have based on those kinds of things would be wonderful. Look at your, um, your BOCES program that uh, you're doing with um, the pre-engineering in the Norwood and Augensburg Tech Centers. That's a perfect example. Those kids are partnering with SUNY Canton. They're getting college credit. You know, it's exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about here, I think. And, you know, you and I, Bess, had talked about uh, if, a, if a small district doesn't have a physics teacher or doesn't have a calculus teacher, why couldn't they get on the BOCES bus and come to your district where you have one? Exactly. And take, you know, take a course or two. They don't have to be a student in your district, they just have to get there for a class. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how we leverage our, mm -hmm. our, some of our assets and make sure that kids aren't behind the eight ball just because they happen to come from a small district. Yeah. Did you have some thoughts? Well, actually, when Tom was, was reading down that executive summary, uh, it became very clear that these are, for the most part, efforts that we have already started. That this is not something that we're putting out in the future and, and as an expectation for someday. It's happening right now, and it's happening increasingly. And when you talk, Donna, about students going other places to get what their own school can't offer. Uh, I think the statistic is that uh, already about 44% of our 11th and 12th graders on a daily basis go from their home school to a BOCES mm -hmm. for uh, career and technical education, for pre-engineering, for uh, allied health. I mean, there's a whole litany. Uh, we're already starting in that direction. I don't think it's such a big leap to go from there to regional high schools. Okay, it's a leap. <laughs> but we're it's not for the students. No, no, no exactly. It, exactly. It, we're already starting down the right road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, and you know, getting back to results, one thing we all agree on is that we want our students to be well prepared for this fast-paced world that they're going to have to compete in. And I'm curious about, you know, what are we doing for the students a, who are interested in college, but um, you know, might not have the money for tutors for their SAT tests, and um, you know, they need help, but there aren't as many teachers anymore. Um, and I'm also curious about the role that BOCES plays, and maybe what else we could be doing for students who are driven, but might college isn't really the path that they would like to take. Um, so maybe Tom, you could tell me a little about the BOCES um, aspect since we just brought it up. Mm -hmm. Well, it, you know, and I, I think Bess just touched on it. You know, we've got 44 percent of juniors and seniors around the county already uh, attending CTE programs. Um, you know, really the root issue is engagement. 
Mm -hmm. You know, you have to engage students. And so the, the research on CTE is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. now, if you get kids involved in CTE, um, they're going to graduate at much higher rates, fewer mm -hmm. dropouts. Um, and, and I think if you get them involved in CTE earlier, mm -hmm. so I think, you know, state policymakers are already looking at that, moving CTE down to grades 9 and 10, maybe even move it uh, into the middle school uh, if possible. And that's how you engage kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think Harvard did the Pathways to Prosperity report, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly our CTE programs at the BOCES are doing the sort of things they recommend in the report. Uh, but we need to go even further. You know, if, if you look at the northern European countries that are cited in that report, mm -hmm. um, what they are doing is involving businesses. It's another partnership mm -hmm. opportunity, formalized partnerships with business where they give uh, children a very articulated, clear pathway to a career. So mm -hmm. a student knows, um, I can do this and I can earn a, a, a living wage mm -hmm. doing this. Now, Anne, did you have any thoughts about preparing graduates and making sure that they're ready to enter college? Yeah, I have a, a number of ideas about it. First of all, I think the state needs to ease up on the mandates that are uh, so onerous on schools. And I think we need to rethink what high school means, or even middle school to that extent. Uh, at a conference I was at um, a few years ago, I can remember one of the presenters saying, that for the non boces for the non-vocational students who are in our high schools, we treat each one in their academic subjects, English, math, science, et cetera, as if they're going to college and going to major in that subject. Mm -hmm. And they were suggesting then that that's a mistake. And I agree with that because I believe that we would do students a service, students who know that they are not attracted to, say, mathematics. Instead of making them take algebra, trigonometry, and geometry, I think that they would be much better served to go through high school and to learn about finance, banking, mm -hmm. credit, mortgages, mm -hmm. car loans. Mm -hmm. We have balancing your accounts. I could fill up four years worth of knowledge <laughs> that students need, and they should take it 9 through 12, and then when they actually got out, they would be far better prepared. I think that we are missing the boat uh, in not giving this vital information, especially given the state of the economy right now, to mm -hmm. students. And the, the next thing I'll say is that practical mathematics as applied to banking and personal finance would probably spur any number of those students who thought they didn't want to bite off theoretical mathematics into thinking, I like math, whereas going the theoretical route I think turns off a lot of students because they yeah. keep asking, what am I going to do with this? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do with pi r squared? And so um, I would, I would, the other thing I think is there has to be a paradigm shift about what BOCES is and what vocational ed is because mm -hmm. right now there is an attitude that only a certain type of student goes to BOCES and I think that that is a mistake. It's got to change and to be frank with you, I think we're also doing a disservice to our students by not ensuring that all of the students have to take some vocational education all through high school. Mm -hmm. They should know something about plumbing and not come out, as my husband would say, educated idiots. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. who, you know, the water's leaking, what do I do? You know, uh, I, I got a checkbook, what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. uh, how do I write a check? You know, uh, I, I think that we know what they need to know and the state has put on our backs what we need to do and it's the continuation of what we've always done that's got to change. Well, and, and I know that we've touched already a little bit, actually, about how the colleges in our region, the universities here, um, inspire and actually do offer programming that, that enriches opportunities for area youth in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM fields, but also arts and visual arts, music, mm -hmm. um, and of course athletics. They, they do travel around and go to the different campuses. It's mm -hmm. some, some students, that's the way that they're introduced to college here. That's right. um, so skipping ahead, I'm also curious about our teacher tra training programs, which, um, which we have now at four different colleges in our region, SUNY Potsdam, JCC, St. Lawrence, and now SUNY Canton, both for teacher training and early childhood education. And I'm curious, um, what, do you, what do you think about the state of teacher training, if, if there's a way to touch on this really quickly, about reaching those educators before they even get to the classroom to make sure that they can do the most with what, with what they've got. Um, Anne, do you have any thoughts about that? I do. It's been a topic that's been broached nationally by uh, Education Secretary Duncan. 
And I think it's something that many of us who have been through these programs know is it's something that's in need of examination. Uh, there are many good things that could be taught to students in preparation for the classroom. As it stands now, I think that um, for many people who are attending school, they're feeling that any number of their courses are too much busy work. And so I think that people like Mr. Burns, Mrs. Kearney, people who are in the superintendent positions need to have a very honest discussion with the colleges to do what is best for the students in the college and to do the best for what kind of teacher they will become and how prepared they are when mm -hmm. they get out. And Bess, what do you say to aspiring teachers and, and also, of course, new teachers when they come into your district? Do you have advice that you give them as they embark? Actually, I tend to learn from them more okay. than <laughs> to try to inspire them. In many cases, they inspire me. They come with enthusiasm. Uh, by and large, they come with, with wonderful new skills. And they sometimes come with stories about their own college ed education. And that is that very often there's a disconnect in college, in graduate school, between what they're taught and how it's taught. <laughs> uh, so that what is probably the least valued manner of teaching students right now is the stand and deliver. I will stand behind the podium, you will sit there in rows and, and absorb sponge-like what I have to tell you. Uh, I think we, we passed that by at a gallop so long ago and yet and not to paint with too broad a brush, mm -hmm. that seems to persist in schools of education as the manner in which creative educational techniques are taught. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there needs to be far more modeling, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm very pleased with the quality of students that are coming into our classroom. And that professor lecturing model is, I guess, a hard one to break. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, you're also doing things with sort of like pre-teaching, aren't you, where you've got people, st college students coming in and doing um, mentoring and uh, study skills and things like that with your reading in particular, I think. Yes, Is it your have, district? Yeah. We have reading interns. Right. They're that was saving it. us because these are graduate students who are coming and getting the experience, but we are also benefiting mm -hmm. from their knowledge, at their wonderful new skills, and the fact that they really are, you know, they don't break the budget to mm -hmm. bring them in. Yeah. And the more we can get cooperation like that with uh, teacher colleges and graduate schools, the more it benefits us. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, just getting back to the big question that's behind everything we've been talking about today, and that's are we doing what's best for the students? Um, are we going to do a better job for the, our kids in the years ahead? Or, you know, are our fears realized and maybe we've reached a high watermark? Um, so let's go around the table and I'm curious, do you feel optimistic? Do you feel pessimistic? Um, are some of these ideas realistic? Um, and I guess I'll just start with Tom and we'll, we'll go around to wrap up. What do you feel? Um, but I would say I'm optimistic and I, I say that with, uh, I, I was a history teacher so you know looking through a historical lens, every time we've had a crisis in this country we, we've risen to the challenge and I, I can't see us not answering the bell for this round. Um, Winston Churchill said that Americans always do the right thing after they've exhausted all other options. <laughs> and so we're, so we're exhausting some of the other <laughs> options right now. Uh, some will work, some not. And, and I actually think, and I, I think you have to be an extreme op optimist to think this way, that I think this financial crisis is going to help us in the long term because it's going to force us to abandon the factory model of education mm -hmm. we've been doing since uh, World War II or before um, that wasn't really tied to research about what was best for kids. Mm -hmm. So it's going to push us in that direction and it's going to push us there really fast because we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Obes, what about you? Well, I have to agree with Tom. Uh, I do feel optimistic only because right now we are forced to examine everything we do. Mm -hmm. We don't have the luxury of being complacent about anything. Uh, and in that is an opportunity to say, yes, these are the things we do well. Let's do them better. Mm -hmm. These are the things where we could change, even though it might be a little uncomfortable. So if we don't, by the way, take this as an opportunity 
We cheat in ourselves. Yeah. Anne, what are you thinking? I'm very optimistic, and, uh, and I'll say that because of the kinds of people who are sitting around this table, and I feel that uh, there are many more like us who have a strong commitment to the next generation, and we're not going to let them down. That's good. That's great. What do you think? I'm, I'm, also, I'm also very hopeful. Um, I think we understand as a society that we can't afford to get it wrong with education, and that we have administrators and teachers and school board members and community members and parents who all want this to work. As Beth says, we've maybe got to find a few new pathways, but we absolutely have all have the same commitment. We can't afford not to have our students be successful because they're going to be our doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs. And if, if they can't do the job, we're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And it's not just our kids, but it's our grandkids. And we're part of a long tradition um, in this country of, of educational success. And maybe we've lost our way a little bit, but I agree that the financial crisis is a good way to sort of redefine and reprioritize. So I think, you know, if we meet the challenges that we've talked about here tonight, we stand a good chance of addressing the issues that need to be addressed. And we've got great tools in place. That's one of the things that I think the BOCE survey really did was it gave us an understanding of, of what we have to work with here. We've got the, uh, we've got the physical uh, transportation network. We've got great distance learning. We've got the colleges. We've certainly got plenty of opportunity and a lot of good minds. So I think we've got a we've got a good we stand a good chance of making this work. That's great, and I hope that your high spirits are infectious. Yes. <laughs> that is a good sign. So I want to thank you, everyone, for giving your valuable input on all of these important issues. Um, this kind of dialogue is the exact kind of introspective conversation that we need around the dinner table, around the Board of Education tables, at our teacher's desks, at our superintendent desks, you know, in order to make sure that we can face these challenges together. So I think your diverse concerns speak to the immense passion that drives our parents, our teachers, our administrators, and our school board members to really work together to improve our schools. So that's what gives me hope. I think it should give us all hope that we can work together to solve these problems and so we can ensure that the next generations get the education that they deserve. On behalf of the organizers, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for taking the time to talk with us and for your willingness to participate in this local civic media program. Remember, look for common ground because our North Country matters. <laughs>